Um, welcome. I'm really thrilled to be here. And I just did a quick scan of, of you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, present to you. What I'd like to do, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. I really want to do a hands-on project. It's a flexagon. And I'm just, as a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the flexagon? Um, oh, good. So many of you are. So maybe we can run through it a little bit more quickly. What I will do um, is I'm going to do the demo. And if you want to make one along with me, you're welcome to. If you'd rather just watch, that's totally fine. Um, but I really love this structure. And then what I'll do is I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind journey of my own art and crafts experience. So I have quite a few samples to show and I would love for you to ask any questions that you might have. You can type them in the chat if you want, or if you wanna wait until the end. Um, but I wanna make sure I get the project going first. It'll probably take maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll show you uh, various book arts that I've done um, along with other crafts starting from the beginning but and i'll try to give it sort of a quick overview but i am passionate about all things arts and handmade and with a particular interest in book arts have always been so i'm hoping that um, this might spark some ideas for you and i would love to hear any questions that you might have along the way because it's a learning experience for both of us so if you can um spotlight the overhead that would be great so you see here, this is um, originally this flexagon was, from what I understand, it was created by a mathematician, I believe at Princeton. And it was roughly maybe in the 19, let's see, actually, I have a little bit of history here, 1930s, I believe. Um, but the person who made it really most well known is, I would say, Ed Hutchins. Um, how many of you are familiar with his name? A couple of you might have. So he's based in the East Coast and he made it more popular, I believe maybe in the 50s or 60s or something. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a tetra tetra flexagon. So there is a, a, a wonderful book artist who's written many publications, Elisa Golden. I'm gonna show you her book. So you may know this book. This is a compilation. I think she had written four or five before this, but this is a really great resource. I occasionally will come back to this. Um, I have learned a lot of the structures previously, but it's just a nice reference tool. So she calls it a tetra te tetra flexagon. And here it says that, um, yes, it was developed by a, a person named Arthur H. Stone, a mathematics student. I believe he was at Princeton, but I'm not sure it didn't say that this was back in 1939. And then later, somebody else wrote about it, a person named Martin Gardner wrote about it. Um, and I believe Ed Hutchins around in the 60s or so in New York made it more popular, became sort of more mainstream. There have been various publications. So what I'm gonna show you is how it actually works. It's just one sheet of paper. And from one sheet, it yields four panels. So we have this first panel. You turn the whole thing around. I now happen to do this on fruits, pears. Then you fold it down and you separate it out like, like, like you're separating oranges <laughs> and the third panel. And then the last panel, you do the same thing. You have to fold it all the way down and then slowly separate it. So you have four panels. It goes only in one direction. So if you want to reverse it, you just do everything backwards. So that's one example with fruits. Um, I did a quick one. You know, if you can think of four panels or a, a a theme that covers them all. This happens to be the four seasons of the year. I just did this one recently. So spring, summer, fall, winter. I find it most effective if you actually use all the panels and cross over all the little cracks. You can certainly um, you know, work on each little panel if you like, if that works. Let's say you're doing some poetry and you're going to illustrate it. Um, that's another option. But I like actually using the entire the entire surface of the panel. This, this is another one that my son actually had done and I uh, replicated it today. Um, he was taking biology um, and how many of you have some biology background? Good, all right. You may remember, I never actually took biology but I found this a very clever way of um, showing the idea of mitosis or cell division. So you start out with two 
separate cells, I believe, and they call it the prophase. You turn it around. The second phase is a metaphase, and you can see that there is um, some tension pulling at the individual units. You turn it down third, and they have separated um, or are still the, the original one has separated out into half, and then that's the anaphase, I believe, and the last phase is the telophase where they became two separate cells. So I happened to post this um, on Instagram at one point and all these people, biology, you know, students and teachers, it, it got a lot of notice. I was actually kind of surprised. I, I took a video, which is sometimes a nice way of showing a process of um, a series. So we're gonna try and make this. I think it's all doable. Um, if you have a piece of, you can use bond paper or heavy paper, but I like using a lightweight cardstock mostly because if I'm using, you know, markers and if it bleeds a little, a little bit thicker stock is more useful. So we have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And for our purposes, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I need to plug in my, my um, overhead unplugged itself. So I wanna plug it so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't run out of use. For our purposes, we're going to trim the eight and a half by 11 down to eight and a quarter because we're using, we're not using metric system. I just think it's easier if we work with nice, even increments. So, um, you know, it's totally possible. What we want to do is we want to have three panels, three equal panels, and you can certainly fold it, but I think it's easier if we trim off a quarter inch. So I'm going to do that first. And that way, each panel, the width will only be uh, something like two and three quarters. I am grabbing my tools here. So if you're if you're following along or if you want to do it, take your eight and a half inch wide sheet and just trim off a quarter inch. And that leaves you with an eight and a quarter inch width paper. And so if you want to have equal Panels and thirds is a much nicer, friendly number. We're talking about two, three, two and three quarters, make a little tick. And then five and a half inches, make a little tick at the top. I'm going to do the same thing on the bottom, two and three quarters, five and a half inches. Just make a little tick. That will indicate where we're going to make our score marks. So I have my bone folder, I have my straight edge, and I'm just going to join those tick marks make a nice score, maybe do it twice. I like to fold up the edge of my paper to, I already have my straight edge there, so I'm sort of encouraging that crease before I take my ruler away. And you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna join those two tick marks, the first two tick marks you made. At this point, you know, I have a little pencil mark underneath. It doesn't matter so much. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm bringing my paper up and just encouraging that crease. So there you have, the thirds, right? And if you want to take another crease with the bone folder, you certainly can. If you don't have a bone folder, it's it's fine. It's just that, the, as you know, <laughs> the bone folder is really useful for making those nice clean scores and then burnishing it down. So we have our three, three panel this way. The next thing you're gonna do, and mostly you probably know when we have reams of paper, they're running grain long. So these, these creases actually happen pretty pretty easily. Our next step will be cross grain. But again, even if you're using like say 65 pound cover stock, it's doable. I don't necessarily have to create a score. You're just gonna take your sheet and fold it in half. And I'm not gonna score it. I'm just gonna crease it because at this weight, at this weight, the 65 pound hard stock seems to work. So if you, if you need me to slow down or if you have any questions at any point, you know, feel free. You can even unmute yourself and say, oh, can you just um, repeat that? I'm happy to repeat any of the steps. We have will our- please, mm -hmm. will, you, will you please repeat the measurements? Yes. And also, can you slow down just a bit, please? Sure. So the measurements are after you trimmed off the quarter inch from the eight and a half, that leaves you an eight and a quarter width, full sheet of paper. Then you're gonna take your- ruler and you're going to mark off a little tick mark at two and three quarters, right? My, my I'm zero on the left edge and I want two and three quarters at the left uh, right here tick mark. 
And then if you double two and three quarters times two, that gives you five and a half. That's a nice, nice friendly number. <laughs> so I'm all about friendly numbers. Okay, then you're gonna repeat that same thing on the bottom because basically I want to be able to join my tick marks and know that they are perpendicular. So I do the same thing on the bottom. I'm two and three quarters and five and a half. I'm just making little, little pencil ticks. Then I take my straight edge and I'm joining those tick marks. Scoring it would be ideal because that helps, um, you know, you create that, you, you create a groove. So that makes your thirds. Is that so far okay? Yeah, all right. So once we have the thirds, we turn our paper horizontal. I like, I like to fold it that way. I mean, you don't have to turn it horizontal, but you're basically going to now fold cross grain, but it, it'll be fine. Even if you have um, 65 or so card stop, you're gonna fold it in half, right? And, you know, I teach, uh, I, I teach young kids, young students. So we call this the hamburger fold, whereas this, these were hot dog folds, right? Because they're long and skinny. So we're making a hamburger fold. And you can, at this point, you can keep all the folds there. Right now, these are all valley folds, right? Or if you turn this around, these are all mountain folds. That's totally fine. Now, the next step takes a little bit of coaxing. You're going to take this edge. Basically, we are making a gate fold, right? A gate fold meet refers to two doors that open up. And I'm sure some of you may be totally familiar with these terms already, but I'm going to make a gate fold. So what I like to do is I take my edge and I, I move my left panel up, take my right edge and just bring it right to that crease right here. Okay, and then you can crease it down. If you have your bone folder, I would, I would score it. I mean, uh, I would burnish it. And you're gonna do the same thing on the other side. If you are really comfortable with folding with your right hand, you can turn the whole thing around and do that. But if, you know, if, if you're ambidextrous folder, you are going to take your left edge and just have it meet right there in the middle. Sometimes I'll just raise my panel to make sure I didn't overshoot. And you're gonna crease. So I'm just gonna check in with the group. For those of you who are doing this, are you, is that much so far clear? All right, that's great. You can hold it up if you want. So what you've created now are, you basically have four times three. You have 12 square modules, folded modules. Okay, the next thing you're gonna do is open up your entire sheet. And I would keep it, I think at this point, I would keep it at um, so that they're all valley folds as opposed to mountain. We don't want the mountain facing up. We want all the valley folds fold facing up. You're gonna take your pencil and where you can, I wanna make this sort of intersection right here, a little more obvious, and the intersection here, more obvious. And you wanna basically make the four points where they intersect right here, this middle. You can see two, two square modules and you wanna get those two corners, uh, all the four corners. I would, I would mark them. And the next step I'm going to do, but you don't have to do this. I'm just doing this so that it's more obvious where I'm cutting, but you do not have to do this. So I'm going to draw this, but again, I would probably not do this on yours because you probably have to end up erasing them, but I'm only doing this as a demo purpose. I am drawing a dark line to show you where I'm going to cut. And that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna take your straight edge, you're gonna take your craft knife and you will cut, basically you're going to join those two dots, those tick marks. So you got two long ones that are running along the long side of your paper and you will only cut on one side of the short one. If you cut out both sides, what will happen? <laughs> You'll have a whole, you'll have a window. You don't want the window. We want this still to be intact. So I am just cutting along the lines and I drew those lines to make it more clear where we're actually cutting. So I'm gonna check in again with the group and see if you, if that's clear first. Nice, that's great. I love it when you hold it up so I know that um, you're following along. 
And we have such a nice big group today. We actually have two, two galleries. Looking good. Okay, are we at a point where we think we can go on? Nice, looking good. Okay. So everybody has, you basically have this big old a flap, right? So the next step is um, you're gonna take this flap and I, I let's just be, we can be, if we are consistent, even if you're right-handed or left-handed, just take your flap and move it over to the right. Now you do see a window, that's what you want. And you're gonna move this flap again, just tuck it underneath on the far right side. That's perfect. So do that. And while you're doing that, I'm just gonna grab a piece of tape. It can be scotch tape or it can be masking tape. Doesn't really matter. Scotch tape works pretty well. Um, maybe I'll do that, I'll get some scotch tape. You don't need a whole lot. You just need a little bit that will hold, hold your piece together. So are we all at that point where you have that window? Excellent. Okay. No. So, okay. Take your time. And I'm going to actually explain that one more time. So when, once you cut it, right, you're going to take that flap, fold it all the way over, right? And then you can see that it's, it's protruding beyond to the right. And you just, it's basically what we call a barrel roll. And you're going to fold that flap. You're basically rolling that middle flap around this very far right column. Okay, so I just wanna make sure everybody is at that point and then we can take the next step. We're pretty good. Hey, don't be shy if you need me to repeat something, I'm happy to do that. Cool, okay. Now that we have this, this flap all rolled around that far right column, you're gonna continue the barrel roll from the left side. So I'm going to put myself back into speaker. I'm sort of toggling between um, speaker and gallery. Okay, the left side is going to start to barrel roll. So we fold this down. Barrel roll means it's just rolling in on, its, in on itself. Like you're doing like, I don't know if you've ever baked pinwheel cookies or something. So then you continue to roll like this. Okay, and I'm sort of holding on to the, the right edge. This is now, you're almost there. You are almost practically done. Um, lift up, okay, keep everything intact. Lift up, turn the whole thing around. That's what I would do. And when you do that, you are going to have this, this loose flap here. So we need to secure that loose flap. I'm taking a piece of just scotch tape. I think I'm, my scotch tape is really wide. I think I'm gonna narrow it a little because occasionally we have to draw on top of this tape. It's a little tricky. So I'm just narrowing it slightly. You don't have to, it's just my preference. You could take a piece of masking tape too. So this, this flap that was over here, you are going to tape that down and that will secure it and make sure you kind of, you know, give it a good burnish with your, either your bone folder or your finger. And immediately, this, this is really important, take your pencil and mark a number one in the top right corner. So just keep in mind, because so the flexicon can be a little bit confusing. What you want in, in my samples, every time I have one of these panels, I always make sure the number is in the top right corner. Okay, that's important. So each panel, the number, number two is in the top right corner. I do it and then because what happens is that when you have this, this is the correct panel, but you'll notice on the back side, it's all, you know, it's all mixed up and the number is in the middle. This is not the panel we look at. We always look at the panel with the number on the, on the top right corner. So we're going to create that now. So are we at a good point where everybody put the tape there um, piece down and put a number one in the top right corner. Yeah, looking good. Okay. So place your panel down with the number one and the tape facing up. And then the next thing you're going to do is we are going to flip the whole thing over. Okay, so just flip the whole thing over. Now your tape side down and we have this new panel. 
Take your pencil and write a number two in the top right corner. And that's the order of how we're gonna, we're gonna add some content if possible. It can be really simple. So just take your time and do that. And when you're ready, we'll continue from there. But I, I just wanna slow down and make sure everyone is in the right, we're all on the right. It helps when we're creating it to be on the right track. When, you're, when you um, add content, you can go at any pace you want. You can even do it while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, while I'm giving my uh, rest of my presentation. So are we good on panel number two? Yes? All right. So the next thing, if you've never done the flexagon, this is the key. And some of you, many of you have done it. The key is you're gonna fold it downward. Let me get back to my speaker so I can see myself. You're gonna fold all the way down like this, right? And you're keeping it perpendicular, 90 degrees. That makes it a lot easier. Then you put your thumbs on top I come on to the top and you separate it as if you pretend you're separating orange sections, right? And you might have to coax it a little. It might fight a little bit in the middle, but don't be afraid. It will rotate on itself. Okay, so the key is when you're at this, this stage, this is number two, it's flat. You need to fold it all the way down, get it 90 degrees vertically, put your thumbs on top and gently, you know, open it up left to the left, to the right. It'll open up and then you write a number three on the top corner. It's pretty cool. Okay, so were you able to, to do that overall? Looking good. All right, sometimes the fourth panel is a little trickier. I don't know why it fights a little bit, but basically you're gonna do the exact same thing for the very final fourth panel. You want to make sure you fold your flexagon all the way down. You got to fold it nice and crease. You know, the creases are already there, but you want to encourage it to be at like really 90 degrees. And then you can separate out like opening the sections of the orange. And you'll notice there's a there's a fold here and this is just a single sheet here, just, but that's okay. And just open it up. And that's your last panel, right at number four in the top. And that's basically it. So this particular flexagon only goes in one direction. It does not go perpetually. So you have to go backwards, you know? So in order to go backwards, you just do exactly everything in reverse. I close it up and I, and I, I appeal it from this way, <laughs> three, okay? And then if you wanna go, then you do it again. Because right, you just want to make sure if you ever see a number in the middle, that's not the right side. You just want to keep your number at the very top right. That is the panel you will decorate. So I'm, I'm continuing to go backwards. I just fold it and I splay it open from down below. Here's two. One and two, they're on opposite sides of each other. So once you reach panel number two, there's no more, there's no more else, no place to go beyond there. Does that seem pretty clear overall? And then... We'll just take like maybe, I don't know, five minutes. You can just sketch something rough. Um, I'm just going to make, a, let me see. I had my markers and I am looking for them now. Okay, I can't find my markers, but I'll get a color pencil or something. I'm just going to draw an outline of a block block letter giant. Um, if you want to do a little, you know, drawing or something, feel free. I'm just gonna pull out a couple of. Elaine, we have a couple of questions. Yes, yes. Um, one person says mine has a two on the left top and the other person says, please fold from number three again. Okay. If you have a number two on the left top, is it in the middle? Is that true? You can just unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, Okay, that just means here, in fact, I can do that. That just means you are looking, you're looking at it like this, okay? Sorry. So don't worry, but just be sure that you do not do your decorating with it looking like that. It just means this is the wrong, incorrect side to do any decorating. If you flip it around, you will see you have a number three in the right corner. That's the panel that you will decorate. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're decorating your panel, make sure the number's on the top right corner. That's, that's very important. In Could order you show us how you go from folding three, mm -hmm. four, 
to so I've let's say I folded three and I have my three. Can you see that this is three? Mm -hmm. okay. So to get to the four, you got to make sure you fold it completely 90 degrees. It has to be really folded well, 90 degrees. And then you put your thumbs up on top and gently open that up. It may want fight you a little bit on the first time or two. Do you see how that works? Yeah. So it was three, but that last panel sometimes. I don't know, it, it sticks a little, but if you have a, a piece of tape, it should, what's happening is you're rotating. And I know it's a math thing. I cannot give you the algorithm or anything, <laughs> but I think it's really genius. It's all from one sheet of paper, right? So now I'm reading some of the chat. I, I can't read all the chats, but um, someone mentioned they taught geometry. Yes, they would love this. I've taught this to a whole class of third graders where, I helped them, they constructed along. I, I, I creased them or I folded or cut, pre-cut, but they they did the constructing. It was great. <laughs> so I'm just gonna do really quickly because I do wanna get, um, and, and you can start decorating, but make sure when you decorate, the number's always on the top right. Okay, so I'm just gonna do, so I'm just gonna do some block letters. So I'm like pretending I'm making a giant A. And um, the tape sometimes will impede, but that's all right. So I just want to show it so that, you know, we can put it to use. I think adding content always really helps. So there's my A and take your time. You can work at your own pace and you can continue to work even while I'm talking later. I just want to give an example. So I'm going to do a big capital B. I was studying um, what my, my son had made when he was taking biology and it was really nicely done I have to say I hadn't looked that closely until today when I had to replicate it <laughs> um so I think I'll just make some hash diagonals to give an idea of solid colors okay so that's b so one and two don't forget one you do and then two, in order to access two you just turn the whole thing over that's two you don't start rotating until after two. So after two, you fold it down, you open it up, and I'm going to make uh, another letter form. Let's see. Okay, how about a giant C? But you can see that the possibilities are endless. I mean, you can choose any topic you want, you know, whether it's food or, um, you know, a theme. It could be sports. I did it once where they chose sports and they cho showed a different sport, something that is easily illustratable. <laughs> okay, when you're on three, you do the same thing. You fold it down, keep it vertical, and then gently open it up. And we got four. So my number four is D. I think I will use like a gray blue D. So were you able to try that out? And, and some of you are probably still decorating or adding content, but hopefully you had a chance to try it out and, and it works. So um, if you, you know, I would encourage you to make more than one, make, make, make another one later today, because <laughs> you're like me. I learn it, I do it, I compare it, and then afterwards, I can't remember. So try try and make some more. And if you really would, I'm going to type in my email here. If you really want, I have a handout that I, I can provide. Just email me and I will give you that. Sure. It's egc at eg2.com is my email. And actually, while I'm at it, I think I'm going to type in my um, another way. You can message me via Instagram if you want. I'm just curious. Um, it, my Instagram is at egchu and the number one. I'm just curious from this group, how many of you do, you do you view Instagram from time to time? Or do you post? Oh, good. We have, we have a few. I really love Instagram. I use it like a library. I mean, if I type in hashtag book arts or hashtag um, flexagon or hashtag, you know, optic stitch, and I can see all these others that are all in that category. Um, it's, it's a great source of inspiration, sparking ideas. So it, it Really, I, I like it as a tool very much. Any questions before, any other questions before we go on? I'm gonna go on and just give you, I'm gonna try to give you a quick overview because I'm realizing it's about, let's see, it's two o'clock your time. So let me ask um, either Julie, Linda, or 
uh, Kim, how much time would you like me to talk <laughs> from here? I, I have a question. I posted it in the chat. Okay. Do you want to say it out loud? <laughs> sure. If if you make a flexagon and you give it to someone, how do you tell them how to open it and for yeah, lack of a better that's term, a really good, read that's it? That's a good point. Um, what I would do is make a little video of yourself using it. And then you can send them. I mean, nowadays, you know, a lot of us do have iPhones. You can make, I happen to have this overhead. I have a tripod. My overhead is actually a very um, basic. Or get somebody to hold, to shoot a video of you doing it. And then you can just send that to them. You can even text it to them if you want. Just a little mini clip. Otherwise, it, it is a little harder to describe, right? If someone has never seen a Flexagon ever. So I would, I would make a video clip. I think actually, you know, these reels and videos are helpful in a structure such as that because it's hard it's sometimes it's not always completely intuitive <laughs> right and knowing that the number should be on the one it looks funny right it looks backwards like i showed you before they have to know that you keep the number in the upper right corner or you can write a little explanation briefly elaine some of the other questions that i notice mm -hmm. uh, pertain to how to open it from the start to the end and then go backwards again Correct. So I'm going to demonstrate um, that in a second. I'm just trying to look at some of these. Uh, somebody mentioned about instructions in a book. You know, I haven't I haven't actually looked online for a YouTube video, but I do recommend Elisa Golden's book if you want to have more than just the flex on. She this one is called I think it's called Making Handmade Books. 100 plus bindings. She actually has this one and she has other examples of other flexagons. I just chose to show you one. It is in here and it is on page 128, if that helps. It's called a tetra tetra flexagon. There are other ones that are um, perpetual and they're in different shapes. Uh, so hopefully that will help. And um, let me show you again. Yeah, somebody thought that we needed two sheets of paper. Oh, uh, Julie has posted a, a link for that, so that's helpful. Um, let me go back and show you again how to go from, I'm sorry, I kind of lost track. Uh, you wanted to know how to go from one panel to the other, is that right? Yes, you know? it seems like some people want to know how to go forwards and then back. Oh, yes. Okay, so here's one, two, mm -hmm. it's easy to go forwards, but to go backwards. What I would do so that I don't get myself so confused, I close the book, but I'm still keeping it vertical and I'm taking it from down below and going like that. That's easier for me to think backwards. Otherwise it's very confusing. Then I'll do it again. I'm on three and I wanna go to two. I'm gonna close the book, take my fingers underneath and pull it apart. Then I have two, right? And then again, I'm gonna continue. Same thing, same process to get to number. Well, actually, sorry. I take that back. You don't need to do that for number one because one is on the opposite side of number two. So you only, to review, you've gotten all the way to the end to your four. So you're gonna close it, put your fingers underneath and flatten it. That gives you three. Okay, to get from three to two, you do the same thing. You close it, put your fingers underneath and flatten it. Once you reach two, you don't need to do any more because two is on the opposite side of panel one. Does that help somewhat? Hopefully. Can you decorate the paper before? You could, but it's very difficult. You have to do some mad, I mean, really you have to plan like crazy. I find it a lot easier to construct your flexagon and then do your, you know, you could do a mock-up and, and plan everything if you wanted to. That's what I would do because it is, you're gonna do like lots of mental gymnastics. So if you really want to do it that way, like, you know, maybe somebody wants to feed their thing through the laser printer or something, you can plan it. But I, I definitely would do a mock-up. Maybe, you know, it, it requires cutting up photos and then gluing them down. You could, but sometimes that might impede how well it functions, right? It's a very uh, structural thing. Any other questions? Can you flatten it and then fold it forward? Does that, did I, does that sort of help? what I did. 
Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I, um, Gail Murray here. Okay. I start, okay, I've got, let me get back to one. Okay, so when I was at one, mm -hmm. I drew quick little lines. Okay, nice. that's my mm -hmm. one. And yep. then, so then I go fold it and- Well, no, actually, what I do is you flip it. You you flip turn it. Okay, the whole yeah. panel over to do right. number two. Okay, yeah, I did that, mm -hmm. yeah, I fold it. Flip, mm -hmm. Then I put pairs. I Correct. Pairs. And yes. now I got my pair side up. So now I fold it again. Fold it downward. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you say downward, like over. Correct. So your so your your edges are pointing downward, and you're making a tent. But actually, more than a tent, you really want to fold it all the way so it's you know flat vertically. Okay. Then you put your thumbs on top. I put it on the top panel because it's easier to um yeah. lay open <laughs> so then i've got three but right. part of my design is showing through my lemons from one is that i think what happened is at some point maybe your numbers got um shifted huh. you have to make sure that your numbers i do before i do any decorating i do all my numbers on the top right corners of each panel yeah. that's the that's very important thought I was following the numbering as you went. Well, I would try, if you have a chance later, try try it again. Right. And um, I, we are making a recording. So if yes, I, you can talk it, it over, it. yeah, maybe if they make, if the recording, if this is okay with everyone, okay. I want a recording for myself, but if it's okay with everyone, and um, maybe you can access that. Okay, I'll, that's what I'll do. Thank you. So- okay. um, Gail, same thing happened to me. I can, I'm on page three and I, I see page um, one in the center well, of the design in the center. So, okay. and I'm sure I'm sure I follow the directions. Try again. You know, a lot of these things. The first time, I always say the first time. You know, you don't necessarily make a masterpiece. You're just familiar. You're rising yourself with. I mean, this is pretty complex to get your head wrapped around. Um, so, try <laughs> if you have access to the recording. Um, and but just try to number all your panels first and make sure they're always in the upper right corner. And then as you're decorating, always look up, make sure that that number is in the upper right corner. That's that those are the two key things. Elaine, there was one other question in the chat. Um, other than tape, is there another adhesive to use? I prefer tape because you need to get it on top. You could use, like I said, either masking tape. I prefer tape because you can't really glue it underneath. That thing is hinging on itself. It really needs to have that sort of a, it's, it's like a bridge area. <laughs> That's how I would describe it. I've never tried it with anything else. I don't think it's going to work that well. You really need this like as a, as a bridge area. So in, in this case, my, my illustration avoided that taped area. So, but it does sometimes, or, you know, if you really don't like it, that it's, that it's um, resisting, you can hold it in place, do all your drawing and then tape it. <laughs> and that way it should show through the clear tape. So yeah, I would, I would definitely use tape. It's so much easier. Any other questions? Is there a video? I don't know, I haven't checked. <laughs> Maybe I should make one, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm glad you, some of you liked it. I, I think it's really elegant. There's so many beautiful things. I love paper, paper, and I love books. So um, it is, it's like magic but it's actually quite logical. Whoever invented it, they, they, they had thought it all out in a careful step-by-step -step way. So um, can you tell me roughly how much time I, I can work with? Elaine? Mm -hmm. Yes, Elaine, um, just to note that Julie posted a link to a video that she happened to find. Excellent. Um, we can make your video available upon request to Julie or me. And uh, I believe we have about 25 minutes. Is that okay. enough? I will. Now I'm going to talk faster because I just want to give you an overview. So maybe a little bit of whirlwind, but there's nothing for you to, um, it's not a, you don't have to, you know, um, you're not making. So I think um, it was Julie, I believe, right, that had shown the, uh, or talked about, I am going to be offering uh, handmade books next week. And I just want to show you the samples. I, I know you saw some of the um, images on the website, but what we're going to do, and we have a good length of time, but I think what we might do is we'll do the more complex one first, 
And this is what I have um, in mind. We're going to paint. I'm very interested in mark making. We can, of course, always use beautiful papers, but we're going to just paint very free form on watercolor. So you have the option of doing something on the outside covers and something contrasting on the inside covers. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be an all over. You can have like, you know, cool colors moving towards warm colors. I often do like have having something look a little different on the inside. So it is a multi signature book with four signatures sewing. Um, and this was a structure, you know, I actually originally learned it from Elisa Golden. I looked in her, the book that I just showed you. It's, she doesn't have the exact same one there, but it's quite elegant. Um, and I think you'll have fun working on that. So that will be our main thing. And then if there's time, I, I think there will be time. I would love to show you some options for, um, I call these slot and tab closures. Basically they're um, pamphlet stitch, which I think a lot of you may already know, um, but just ideas, I'll talk you through it. You can try it if you want. And anything that's left over, you know, you have the option <laughs> to have bookmarks. So that's basically next week, February 18th. And uh, I believe, I forgot what time we mentioned. Is it 1.30 or 12.30? 12.30, I think. Two to four, two to 4.30 Mountain. Two to 4.30 your time. Right, two to 4.30 your time. So I hope some of you can join. Um, it'll be fun. I just love making your own, you know, constructing your own, but also having a chance to do some very free mark making. So that'll be next week. And um, I'll just start, you know, you can interrupt me if it's like, give me a five minute warning at the end. That would be great. <laughs> so, and then I'll- okay. Uh, I can. So basically, um, my background is I had a lot of music background. I actually grew up in a actually maybe you can I'll just leave it the spotlight. Oh, yeah, that's fine. And I'll spotlight the have you spotlight the overhead later. Um, my mother was a was in piano and I had a whole lot of piano all throughout my years from age six on up. But I always loved art. And um, when I was five or so, my dad had a sabbatical and I was born in Pennsylvania. Um, we lived in basically, I was born in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. It's, it's where Bucknell University is. My dad was teaching their history. Then a month later, a month after I was born, we moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he had a sabbatical when I was five years old and we went to Taiwan. And that really made a huge impression on me. I mean, it's still very vivid <laughs> after all these decades. So my very, very first drawings were in Taiwan. I think, can you spotlight my overhead? I think I'm, you can just leave the overhead spotlighted because I'm gonna run through all these. So this was my very, very, one of my earliest drawings, right? And in, in Taiwan, they didn't have crayons. They only had oil pastels. So I believe this is, this is oil pastels. I was learning how to tell time. You know, I was just learning how to render figures and I I guess I was somewhat detail oriented. So this was at the age of five. And when we came back to the States, actually my Chinese was better than my English and it was a little bit difficult in school. I'm mean, making that transition. Um, I was We were back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and I entered first grade um, and we lived on this, I don't know if you can see this, we lived in this, so it's a two story house. There's a basement, but you know, I, it really was a, made a huge impression on me. I played there and it was on a hill. And so I rendered this drawing without looking at the picture because I knew my house really well. Um, at that time we lived on 1015 Elizabeth street and I forgot which side that the house number was. I tried to cover it up with more orange crayon. It's actually on this side. You can still see it on both sides. I remember playing on the A-frame swing set and um, this was done, and this is practically falling apart, but I have really fond memories. How many of you growing up, I know we're all at different ages, but how many of you growing up did Spirograph or had a set, tried it out? Yeah, all right. So you, you're familiar with that. I thought Spirograph was the coolest thing. Um, but um, let's see, is my, is my overhead showing right now? Ah, oh, there we go. We had spirograph, but I had spirograph on foil. So basically you were drawing and creating deboss lines and painting. And I did these when I was eight. Don't ask me why I still have them. My mom saved everything. And then I retrieved everything from her several years ago. Um, also, I wanna just curious, how many of you remember 
doing, taking chewing gum wrappers and making chains. Oh, good. I see several of you know this. I'm just curious. And did you stick with it for a while? So I don't know why I was into this. You know, there's all these vintage beech nut, um, Wrigley's. Uh, I went and traveled to China in the late 70s when there weren't, uh, it wasn't that common. And I got Chinese chewing gum wrappers and it smelled really nice. So this thing is, I did it when I was around, I don't know, 13, 14. Um, it's 30 feet long. <laughs> and it, it was, somebody asked me, why is it in such good condition? Well, it was in a bag or a box and hasn't really seen too much, you know, the light of day and I still have it. So I don't have the heart to get rid of it because I remember my grandmother saying, oh my gosh, that girl has patience, but it was just something fun. And I think that was sort of a harbinger of my love for crafts. Um, do any of you remember taking home ec classes? All right. Okay, so I think I was at the tail end of when home ec was still around. I learned to sew on a machine around age 10, 11. Um, and then I had all these leftover scraps. So this is even before I knew anything about book arts or anything about documenting. You know, Instagram is a way of documenting for me. Um, and so I took the actual scraps of what I made and rendered what I sewed. So I had drawstring apron, I had some pajamas. I was sewing for myself, sewing for my sister, who's three years younger. It was a nautical theme going on. We made, um, I made denim bib overalls. That was really big for a while. I made, so because of all that classical training, I was, um, we were invited to play with a symphony for the very first time. It was a local symphony orchestra. And I made my own dress out of curtain material. Like, like Scarlett O'Hara, but I like the colors, the blues and greens. And I found a picture, that's a picture of me at age 15 wearing that very dress. And you can see that the material's there. Um, it felt good to be able to make what I was going to perform in. Um, I later did that with another concert, but I don't, I don't have a record of that one. And so I continued making overalls, shorts, and you know all kinds of tops. Gabardine was really big for a while. I made pants and denims. So to this day, I still have this. I think I glued it with rubber stamp or some uh, rubber cement. So I'm surprised it's even holding up. So that basically was my childhood art. Um, then, so all along, I went to, I was doing piano all along and then I majored in music. I went to Yale and that's basically what I knew best, right? I, I was playing piano as most proficient in piano, but I did really like the liberal arts um, environment. I did not want to do, I knew I didn't want to do a conservatory thing and that's nothing but music. So I had a chance, I got all my distribution requirements taken care of. In my last year, junior, senior year, I had more chance to take um, art classes. So I took photography. Um, I took a color theory class, which was really wonderful with a, a instructor named Richard Lytle, who many years later I discovered he was so modest that he was an assistant to Joseph Albers, um, the person who has done those color concentric square paintings, all those experiments. Um, and he's still, I think he's still around. He did a solo show a couple years ago. So color theory was one of my favorite classes. And then I discovered senior year, I happened to stumble upon graphic design. Loved it so much that I decided, um, not to go on for graduate work in music. I almost did. Um, and I went, so that's when I went to school in Philadelphia. It's called, uh, it's currently called Univers University of the Arts. At that time, it was called Philadelphia College of Art. So I worked really, really hard, probably worked harder in uh, my graphic design studies than anything else. And that was three years. Afterwards, I worked in New York. I did a lot of corporate design, you know, designing logos, branding, you know, promotional flyers and, um, letterhead, signage. And then I wanted the opportunity to, to live abroad and work abroad. So I had a chance to go to Hong Kong. And at that time, Hong Kong, this was in the late eighties. At that time, Hong Kong was still under British rule. And so almost everything was bilingual. And I found that kind of fascinating having a chance to work with typography. Um, and this was my first book that I ever did. I had done newsletters and done layouts and all that, but basically I had maybe, what, three years of ex work experience. But going to Hong Kong was a whole nother story. In New York, you know, when you're working in studios, it's much more hierarchical, but 
going abroad to Asia, you just dive in. I was given, a, we, they had, I was working with Ogilvy and Mather, an advertising agency, and they had won the account to um, do the branding for, it was called the Hong Kong Cultural Center. So basically we did the logo and all the applications and I had a chance to, you know, as a junior designer in New York, you're, you're just, you're given less responsibilities. But then I'd only been there for like two weeks or something. I worked straight through and they had me present to the urban council and it was being simultaneously um, translated. So I thought I, I was gonna wing it, but I thought I better prepare. So this was basically a book that I did and everything was bilingual. And they had an opening festival with all different, you know, um, musicians and theater and some of these people, many of these people are no longer. I mean, I don't think Joan, Joan Sutherland probably passed a long time ago. And, and because it was in the 80s, they had local, um, local Cantonese opera. They have a picture of, you might even know something, Ian Charlson, and everybody looks really young <laughs> because this was many decades ago. They had Yo-Yo Ma come, I believe, and Emmanuel Axe, um, Jesse Norman, the opera singer. So it was kind of a big deal to have a, an international stage that attracted, here we have, we have Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. But I had done all the layouts and everything, as I mentioned, was um, bilingual. I learned to spec type. And back then, this is pre-Mac days. So all of the production was done by hand. They were not doing this digitally, which was really amazing. So even that um, page with the uh, Cantonese opera, all of that was hand cut. So that was um, a nice project. I stayed there for about a year and a half or so. It was very intense. Um, I came back and I moved to California um, and mo basically freelance most of the time. I had a chance to, this is later, I'm just jumping ahead. Later, I worked on some children's books. You know, the Chinese have a Zodiac with 12 animals. This was the first one I worked on with another person who um, has his own publishing company. So basically um, doing layouts and, but using the kind of book sort of book um, parts, right? This is like the end paper, but of course these were offset prints. So these were commercially printed, but I enjoyed the layout process. This was really part of my, um, part of my graphic design sort of experience. So I did probably six of these out of the 12. And then um, just to show real quick, I had, you know, really some fun projects where the clients let me do almost anything. I had a, uh, they were, this is from Symantec. They had a party. I have an interest in three-dimensional paper engineering. So I had done this little thing um, and had some fun with a type. It influenced my own wedding invitation where I did a, a sort of variation, but this is, you can see it is actually, it has a three-dimensional quality. This is my actual wedding in, invitation that I've designed. My husband's name is Fan, F-A-N, and my name is Chu. So I used red and gold, although in a much more subtle way. Traditional Chinese is a very bright and sort of, in my opinion, garish red and gold. I used a cranberry and um, gold with tints of gold. And this is like the double happiness that's typically used for weddings. And we tinted back the gold to create, you know, a more, uh, to get more mileage out of the, we basically only used two inks. And I created a, my own guest book using a single signature. Um, you know, you can only feed, this is my own laser printer. You can only feed 14 inches, the legal size. So that's the, the longest. And so I worked that out and I had very faint lines. I wanted people to be able to sign their guest book and not have it like going all over the place. <laughs> I created that little logo. So this was fun after I'd done all that. Oh, and then there was a little pamphlet stitch of the um, program, the wedding program. And after I'd had all that, I created this clamshell box. So everything had that sort of that color theme. These bags were available. I did not sew these bags, but I was really happy to find the colors. So this is the clamshell box. Um, pretty simple, but a nice way of housing it. And then along the graphic design um, sort of theme, although I, I'm, you know, I always love book arts and my first book arts uh, class was in Philadelphia, but I had sort of a break. I mean, I didn't do a lot of it when I graduated, 
but my, I, had a, I had a paternal grandmother who, his, her name was Grace Chu, and she was born in 1899. So I created a timeline. She was about to turn, she, Chinese people sometimes celebrate their birthdays a year ahead. So when she was 99, technically, we celebrated her 100th birthday. And her dream was to span three centuries from 1899, which was the 19th century. She wanted to span into the 21st century. She almost made it. She died four months shy of her 100th birthday. So I'm really glad that we did celebrate. And I made this, this accordion timeline. I was inspired by Time Magazine. They always make timelines. Um, basically, it's a summary of her life. I made 45 of these as favors for the, each of the families that attended her party. She had gone to Wellesley in the 1920s and she majored in physical education. So she, this is a picture of her with tennis. She married um, another Chinese um, who was studying, who, who came to college here. They, they both were college educated in the States. And she ended up writing um, Chinese cookbooks and that was her way of supporting herself. She taught Chinese cooking in New York. Um, and I think she was one of the first to do that. She wrote, uh, it's called Pleasures of Chinese Cooking and she called herself Madam Chu. So that was one of my book arts. Uh, another one is just showing traditional ways of binding, right? So I have taken quite a few classes over the years. I took a year long class um, when I've, oh, I guess maybe 20, 20 some years ago but using traditional techniques like Coptic stitch with unexpected material. So, you know, this is an actual vinyl record. It's not my own. I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to cut up mine or my dad's. These are usually records or things that I found either at, you know, thrift stores or recycling places. Um, this is the actual record. And if the album was in good shape, the back cover is made out of the album. Um, I love the Coptic stitch. You can, you can basically put together any two. How many of you have done the cop stitch? Just curious. A few of you? Yeah, nice. Do you like it? It's a very handy stitch to do, to, to put together. And I, what I really like about it is that anywhere you turn, it lays completely flat. Elaine, how, yes. did you cut, how did you cut that LP? Oh, good question. So I took what you call a scriber and you have to make a groove almost like but it's not an exacto it actually creates a groove into the L, the vinyl mm -hmm. and then I hold it over the edge of the table and i crack it off <laughs> and then you have to file it because it's rough so my husband is very handy he has shop tools so he often helps me file them down round the corners but i do actually punch the holes myself do you know the crop do you, it's called a crocodile do you know that no the crocodile I'll show that to you if we have time at the end, but it's it's a it's a hand tool that can punch things. And if the vinyl record is not too thick, the really mm -hmm. early ones are too thick. And sometimes they were glass. You can't do it. Um, you will need a drill press. So occasionally I do ask my I do ask my husband to help me use a drill press on the Lego. I have tried to learn, but um, I don't know. Shop tools are I'm, that's not exactly my forte. I'd rather I'd rather bind books <laughs> and sew instead. So yeah, it's a it's quite a bit of work actually. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, you know, I want the, because it's rounded, and I want the inside pages to be rounded too. Mm -hmm. Although it works better to round just this side, not this side. I tried; it, it gets too close. <laughs> so, but hopefully that gives you ideas. You know, I bound like templates. You know, those circular templates that are plastic. I've bound cutting mats, little mini cutting mats. Anything. I'm always mm -hmm. looking at things with an eye to can I make it into a book. Uh -huh. So um, let's see what else. Oh, um, so because I love teaching books, I, I at one point offered to teach, I called it art and bookmaking to young kids as young as five years old. And I actually, we self-published two, there were two other partners. Um, we were all teachers at an after-school program. There was a carpentry teacher, a sewing teacher, that's the wood, the sewing teacher for scissors and paper refers to me. We each took it upon ourselves. It was quite an undertaking to self-publish a book. So this is my section. Um, it shows examples of some of the projects, pop-up books, pop-up cards. Um, I did not design the inside of the book. It was a little too much with everything. But you know, when they're only in kindergarten, you know, you can do a little counting book. 
right? And I had it sort of festive and they could be just simple ring books. Pop-ups are really popular. This was my son's. He was five or six at the time. He's now turning 22. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I made up this sort of pop-up flowers. I've always been interested in 3D, even though I took graphic design, which concentrated on 2D. Um, I think the 3D aspect is very compelling and engaging for young kids. There's, here's an accordion book. We um, use just finger paints and then stenciled. And I believe I took all these step-by-step -step pictures. Uh, and the last project, everybody had, each one of us had six. This was, we made our own scratch boards. You know, you put color crayon and then you cover the whole thing with black temper paint and then you scratch into it. And my daughter at the time, she was, I don't know, six, maybe seven. Um, we made an alphabet book. So she had to think of an illustration that started with each letter of the alphabet. So that worked out pretty well. Um, it was, took a while to produce. So that was um, teaching art and bookmaking. I continue to teach. I still teach at the after school program, uh, slightly older group. I have a chance to work with high schoolers sometimes, and I love working with adults. Um, I just really like sharing um, all kinds of techniques and methods, structures. Um, one other thing that I've done is um, Chinese thread books. How many of you are familiar with the Zhen Xian Bao or Chinese thread book? Yeah, we has, I see a few hands. So it's kind of an unknown, it's getting to be more known, but it's a really beautiful technique that was developed in certain provinces in China. And sometimes Chinese people don't even know about it. But Zhen Xian Bao, it's spelled Z-H-E-N. Xian is X-I-A-N. Bao is B-A-U. That literally translates into Zhen is needle. Xian is thread or string. And bao actually means wrapper, or in this case, they sometimes think just say it's Chinese thread book, zhen xian bao. Um, sometimes you'll see this, this uh, structure. It's called a flower top, and this is basically an origami. So this is very large. It's not usually this large, but I wanted to try and make a large one out of very thick paper. So I, it opens up, and I had done some stitching. Um, and then if you, this can actually be illuminated from the back. It looks pretty dramatic. So that was really fun. I took a wonderful series of classes with Paula Krieg and Susan Joy Cher. Right. And I don't know if they are, offer, they are going to offer it through you or not. At one time, I think you had some discussion. But if you ever have a chance, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend. It's, it's, it's a long series. I think it's 10 weeks or something. But they're very um, in-depth. But what it allowed me was to um, draw upon what I learned. And I made my own. So this this is an origami. This structure has existed, but I've never seen this particular configuration. So these actually, they turn, you can adjust the configuration. Does this look like an X? You can make it look like an O. Um, but I sort of figured out all the math for it. And I was really thrilled because for me to innovate something, that takes a lot of brain work. Um, and I when, when I'm able to, that's just, it makes my day. It's such a highlight. So, but then the rest of it is more traditional. There are two, two um, boxes, another layer. I stenciled all this, so I created this. Um, and then the last is what we call the big box. The big box serves as its own self cover. So I have taught this. I prefer teaching this particular one in person. I think sometimes it's helpful to be able to um, assist if anyone needs it. But you all did a great job with the Flexagon today. This is one other Chinese thread book that um, I told you I had lived in Taiwan. So my mom had me go to school, learn, learn to read and write Chinese. And when we, I was only there seven months. When we came back, she really wanted me to continue and not forget it all. So she tried very hard and I, we kept it up until I was about age 10. She had me write a daily diary and I wasn't always thrilled about it, but actually I'm glad because it helped me retain the language. So I, I found my diary from age 10. This says April 11th, my dad, daddy brought my sister and me to the library. So I Xeroxed one of my entries. This is the, it was a spiral thing. So I was sort of having fun with the spine idea. It opens up and you have these different layers of folded boxes. This was like one of my, basically I photocopied them because again, I didn't have the heart to cut them up. Um, we had mimeograph sheets for math. We had, you know, we had 
to write our characters over and over again. You can see, and the red is what the teacher wrote to protect, uh, to correct me. And this is the character. I don't know if you can see it. That's the character for books in Chinese. Um, I I was in, living in Taiwan, and they have a phonetic system, so it's unique to Taiwan. So this is the phonetics. Um, you have other layers from from the books, and here's more of the phonetics. I'm going to move it up so you can see, All right? And then the very bottom box. This is a picture of myself at age five. This is how I got to school back then. This is really, really long time ago. Um, we had a, not a driver, but a bicyclist. And I had to wear a uniform, book bag. And I took some liberties, of course, in my coloration. But it's a very personal piece. Um, and I'm thrilled to be able to have content. I, content is something that I sometimes struggle with. I love making structures. But um, to actually have meaningful content takes a lot more thought. So that's it for Chinese Threadbook. That, that's a basic overview of Threadbooks. And I need to probably move, move things along a little bit faster. Um, one of the things I do is beeswax collage. I think you saw, you saw this on the website. It's using melted beeswax, tissue paper, mulberry paper. Um, sometimes I'll use my own block prints. Sometimes I use found imagery. Sometimes I will do something sort of in memory of some. This is my paternal grandfather who was a military diplomat I photocopied his actual medals um because again I didn't want to I didn't want to cut up his passports or anything so I photocopied them um this was the papers that allowed him to travel this happens to say immigration permitted to disembark April of 1941 is when he was traveling to Hong Kong um but always taking it back to how do I bring it back tie it into book book binding so this is my beeswax collage that I photocopied. I created a deboss window, and this is a case-bound book. And the end pages kind of pick up some of the colors. Um, so that's beeswax, one thing that I teach. Another thing that I love, I mentioned, is block printing, um, where you're carving into blocks of, so I actually have the original. When I was, the first block print I ever did, I was 12 years old. And we had this actual school desk in our house. My mom's, I think the school was closing. This is the, the wood piece that I carved. It's huge. It took me like over a week. I was in seventh grade. It was crazy. <laughs> we didn't know about rubber. So nowadays, you know, we carve rubber. Here's an example, which is so much softer and much easier. Um, the block printing is a really nice way. Even if you don't draw that much, these are some of my very first ones. Right, the pencil came out of my head. The bird you've seen probably a few times. I had something to look at, but I basically abstracted it, made it much more graphic. Um, there was a point where my children were really, they were watching me and they started carving their own. This is my daughter's, she was eight. I was watching her like a hawk because those tools are sharp. They're lino cutter tools. Um, how many of you have done block printing? Nice, quite a few of you, that's great. So you know, you know the technique. Um, Sometimes I print not only on paper, but on fabric. So, you know, zip pouches or um, just some examples of zip pouches or cloth napkins. You do need to use fabric ink so that they're color. I mean, they you can throw them in the wash and they won't run. And then during COVID, I made a daily challenge for myself to create a combination of block print and stitching, right? I hadn't really, I didn't know embroidery that much, but, and also I was, at first, I didn't want to have to do really intense amounts of embroidery. So these are just examples where I could do block print and then just highlight certain areas. And this, this stay home is a real reference to the COVID period. So I did, I think it was 36 days. So, so I was able to create a grid of six by six. I've never been able to, um, display these, that was my hope, but they're just all stacked up somewhere. But it was a nice little um, exercise to do. Um, and it's something, if, if you're interested, I'm happy to, to, to share this at some point. We love boba. Um, and I sometimes bring in my own sort of heritage or reference to the, to the being Asian. Um, this is the Chinese character for love. So that's block print and stitch. And last thing, is gel play printing, which is another really fun way of printing using leaves from your yard or just house plants. Because I know, uh, well, you're in San Santa Fe, but at some, some places don't have it. Ha it's not spring yet. 
but you can use house plants. So basically you have the option to make um, really sharp, strong silhouetted images, um, but you're using, and, and this does not require intensive carving because the leaves are the, the leaves become the mask or you can use the leaves in such a way that they are sort of more ghost impressions, lighter. Here's, here's an example of ghost impression. It picks up all the veins and the details in such a nice way. Again, oftentimes when I teach this, I relay it back to bookmaking. At the end, we choose one of the cards and create a pamphlet stitch booklet. Um, and I will be actually teaching this online April 22nd through San Francisco Center for the Book. So if you are interested, um, you can gather your own materials or you can, I also, I can put together a kit of supplies if people want. So if you're interested, it's super fun. Um, overall, the whole art has been a huge, huge influence and in my life. I mean, I don't think I fully realized that until as an older adult, I would say, um, you know, when my dad passed away in 2013, it's almost been 10 years, art became hugely therapeutic. Um, and it just, to this day, I mean, now I, I think about him fondly, of course, but it's, I can't imagine not having, doing it. And so in some ways COVID was a really, you know, I know it was hard on people, but it allowed me to create more. Um, I just like the idea and I'm sure you can relate just working with your hands you know, and, and the process, sometimes it's not always about the results, but the, the process of doing. So I love having a chance to share these with, you know, little kids, my peers, yourselves, um, anybody really. And also what I find really important is to continue learning, to continue to grow. So I take all kinds of classes myself. They don't have to be related to bookmaking. I've done um, crepe papers, um, flowers, and basketry. I'm doing, a, actually right before I logged on today, I'm doing a weekly watercolor class just to sort of explore different mediums. So thank you for listening. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I hope to have a chance to meet some of you online in the future. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you very, very much. That was fabulous. <laughs> thank you. I'm totally inspired. Thank you. There's, if you have a chance, do look on Instagram because I, I love sharing not only what I make, but what my students have made. So mm -hmm. if you have a chance, do look look there. I also have Facebook, but Instagram is more, more um, where I post more frequently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so the only thing we have to sum up today's meeting is community announcements, if there are any. Uh, we want to thank Elaine very, very much for her time today and enthusiastic um, demonstrations of so much. I know a lot of people have learned a lot today. So if you have any community announcements, please uh, either raise your hand or go ahead and speak up. And otherwise, um, this is today's meeting. Thank you. Julie? Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to tell you about something that's happening at Santa Fe Community College, April 1st through 8th. It's called the Monothon. And um, it is, which is a mono printing marathon. And Ro Calhoun Guletas is coming back to sing.